Thank you, Quentin. That was, that was a wonderful intro. Um, I think you'd all agree that the girl who actually never used to talk really knows how to sing. My goodness, that's fantastic. We really enjoyed that. Um, I just want to give notice to the Homes of Hope DTS that I'm going to need your testimony, if you've got a testimony. I know that sounds strange. And I'd like you to come to the front so I know I can call on you. Anyone else? All right. Probably two might do it. Okay. So hang in there. It might be a little while. But we'll see how we go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, tonight I want to speak on healing. And uh, this is a subject really close to my heart. I, I love it. And uh, to me, it's sort of like the kingdom of God in practice. Um, we talk a lot about the kingdom, but doing the kingdom is a lot of fun. And um, I think the way we're going to do it tonight is we're going to be praying for one another. All right? I'm just going to sort of, we're just going to look at the Bible, look at what Jesus did. Um, and uh, we're just going to do a bit of praying for one another. Uh, <clears throat> those of you who have come in from the community tonight, uh, come in from the, the city, you always come to YWAM on a Friday night, you'd come into a context. So the context of this week was at the beginning of the week, uh, we gather every Monday morning, we have a time of worship, and uh, God was really moving amongst us. It was really a powerful time. And uh, I felt like God was speaking to me about something, and that was that God was, there was a surge of the Holy Spirit. It was sort of like the Holy Spirit was lapping into our lives and rising up and onward and going, going further. And, uh, yeah, and uh, I, was, I was able to actually share a little bit more of that on Wednesday. But I've also been aware that whenever God's surging uh, and, and pushing forward, there can often be, um, there can be resistance to that by, by the enemy because he, he knows that God's up to something. So perhaps that's all part of the reason for this tonight. Um, maybe healing is always a ministry of grace. And uh, when Jesus went around the countryside, uh, he was basically always doing two things. He was always teaching, preaching, witnessing, sharing, whatever, but he was always healing. And if he wasn't healing, he was teaching, all right? So it was, it was either uh, one or the other, or it was usually he started to talk and share, but then there was healing that took place. In fact, as you look at Jesus and you look at how he operated all through the four Gospels, there aren't too many chapters that really graphically talk about, you know, his, um, his insisting that people believe on him um, and then he would then do a healing or whatever. He, he basically <clears throat> went, around, went about doing good. And, and people followed him because he was performing cures and people were getting healed. And uh, he had this huge following. <clears throat> people were following him, hundreds and thousands of them, and then there was the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. And then whenever that happened, he would teach them, but then he would always heal them. All right? So um, we're going to just go into a little bit of a... a PowerPoint, so we'll just start that now if we, if we could, all right? So if, if you looked at um, Luke chapter 4, before uh, he actually found the job description for his life, Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. And uh, it says there in, in the first verse, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness where Satan tempted him. And then he was there for 40 days and 40 nights. And uh, the Bible goes on and talks about three temptations, okay? Now, I haven't been able to read a commentary on how long those temptations were, all right? But Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights. So let's just say the temptation lasted a whole day. All right, now, I haven't heard too many speak about this, so I'm, 
I'm stepping out, and, and I'm not developing a doctrine here on the three, on the th you know, on the 40 days of fasting and prayer, and I'm not going to start a church on this, all right? But let's just say um, Jesus was tempted for one day for each temptation, all right? And so that's, let's just say that's three days. And um, let's just say maybe it's a night as well, all right? So that, in my mind, still leaves him with 37 days, all right? So, <clears throat> and he's not eating, um, eating. Uh, I'm not sure if he's not drinking either. I'll have to read the scripture on that. But anyway, he's fasting. So that means there's a lot of time alone with the Father, <clears throat> right? So he is led by the Holy Spirit into a time of fasting and prayer. And it's one of real intimacy and closeness with his Father. But in that time, he gets tempted by Satan himself on three very significant temptations, and we're not going to go into those temptations, all right? But then in verse 14, I believe, of that scripture, it says that he comes out in the power of the Spirit, all right? So one of the things that you could probably conclude from that is that Jesus was leveraging the temptation of the devil to develop spiritual authority in his life in a time of fasting and prayer. And if you ever go into a time where it's just you and the Father and it's a time when you're in the wilderness or you're actually going into a time of, of prayer and it could be fasting, uh, usually after a day or two you get the hunger pains, all right? And then <clears throat> usually after that uh, everything in your system that's not good for you has found a way to get out, all right? And then you're starting to feel weak and then you get to the point where it's beyond hunger and you're nearly dying. <laughs> All right? Uh, but then you get past that, believe it or not, and you then get to this state of spiritual numbness, right, or whatever it is. But it's almost like you don't desire food. And then it's just you and God and nothing else propping you up, which is food usually. The smell of it, the preparation of it, and the eating of it and the satisfaction of it, all right? And then if you are then um, separating yourself and going for walks and doing things and you're spending time with the Father, uh, stuff really starts to happen in your life. And what actually starts to happen, there's some alignments that start to take place between you and God. Um, and then as you bring one by one the things that God's laid on your heart, uh, there's a real sense of confidence and faith. And the thing that I find is that there is a communion that I start to have with God that I don't have otherwise. Now, it's not because I'm bending God's arm. It's just the fact that I've separated myself intentionally, or you have, or whoever the person is, uh, separated ourselves to God, for God, so that God can speak to you and align you and then bring anything into alignment that's out of alignment. There's a, there's, there's a communion that takes place that doesn't happen. It's just that there's more time with God, right? Well, this is what Jesus did, he, but he did it for 40 days and 40 nights, right? And um, this is Jesus as much the man as it is God, right? You've got to remember Jesus is both God and man. And so when he's actually going into the wilderness, he's going in as definitely God's son, all right? But he's also going in as the son of man. He's going in in his humanity. And uh, it's, it's his flesh that's actually coming under uh, a lot of the, um, the assaults of what it means to be fasting and praying and his emotions and his hunger and his thirst and his soul, every aspect of his humanity. But he comes out of that time, <clears throat> he comes out of that time in Luke chapter 4 with, um, he, he comes out in the power of God. He's led in by the Spirit, but he comes out in verse 14, he returns in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. 
all right? So here's the formula, guys. If you want to really have a ministry of healing, and I think every one of us should, because every single one of the disciples did, if you do want to, and I think that that's a noble ambition, and you're not being proud, okay? You just, just want to do it always for God's glory. Uh, ask for it. And time with God will equal power. Uh, Jesus spent lots of time with the Father. And we actually wonder at the incredible anointing that he had in, in healing the sick and raising the dead and with a word casting out demons. But it was because of the time that he spent with the Father. And even though he is God, he's always separating himself to be with the Father. And they were always looking for him in the evenings and they could never find him because he was separating himself to be with the, his Father in heaven. And then he'd actually be there and then in the morning he'd go out in ministry and he'd be teaching as one with authority. But he'd always, always, always with his teaching, he was always ministering. He was always uh, healing people, all right? So what I want to actually suggest here is that every time Jesus taught, he also ministered, all right? So I want to encourage you to think like that, uh, that this is what Jesus did. There was always the power of God at work whenever he's talking to people about the kingdom of God. He goes into Nazareth and he walks into the synagogue there and it's actually in verse 18 and he gets this manuscript and he opens it up uh, to Isaiah 61 and the Spirit of the Lord is upon me so, so that the Lord, so that the Spirit would anoint me and uh, to preach the good news to the poor, okay, to, um, to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recover sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So here's Jesus. After spending 40 days, he goes straight to Nazareth. He finds the word of God, and then he finds out his job description for the rest of his life. And um, I, I think this is a good template. Uh, in times where we separate ourselves to God, God wants to give us a real sense of destiny and, and, a, and a great sense of his call. And if you do separate yourself to God and say, God, I want you to speak to me, believe that God wants to give you a sense of destiny and call because this is what happened to Jesus. Anyway, then it goes on uh, down there to verse 31, okay? Okay. And he finds himself in Capernaum and he's teaching under uh, incredible power and authority. And what actually happens is that someone cries out and, uh, and it's a demon in one of the Jews and it says there in verse 34, let us alone for what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So the thing is about the demons, the demons knew Jesus. The disciples didn't know that he was the Son of God and people around didn't know who he was. But everywhere he went, if there was a demonic entity operating there, they immediately knew, oh, this is the Son of God. So then Jesus had to really tell them to be quiet and tell them to shut up because he couldn't actually, he couldn't be revealed in his identity until it was the right time. And he rebukes this spirit and he just tells it to be quiet. And in, in a public place there, it actually comes out in such a way that people in verse 36 say, wow, this guy moves in both authority and power. All right, I want you to all say authority and power. Authority and power, all right? So we have authority and power. So what's the difference? The difference between authority and power is when the policeman puts up his hand to stop, all right? But the power is that when you actually go through his hand signal and you go through the other side, um, I guess, you know, he's not only got the authority to actually take your number, but he could shoot you <laughs> or whatever, whatever he does, all right? Uh, you know? But uh, the point I'm trying to make, he's got power, right? He's got authority. He's got the authority of the government behind him and he can actually put his hand up to say stop, but he's also got power 
to do something about it. That's the point. And he's not going to shoot you, all right? <laughs> At least I, you know, I'm not here, hopefully, closely. Okay? <clears throat> so, and then we go into verse 38, and um, this is one of the most, the, the, one of the best things that Peter ever did. The, the, the apostle, he actually invited Jesus to actually come into his wife's house because his wife's mother was sick, all right? So this is Peter's mother-in-law, and he invites Jesus into the house to heal his mother-in-law. Best thing he ever did, all right? Because, guys, if you're on the good side of your mother-in-law, you've got a good life for the rest of your life, <laughs> all right? And, uh, you know, he would never have had any more problems with his wife's mother, ever, you know, because Jesus came to town, and Jesus came into the house and healed the mum, all right? But the interesting thing here is that when Jesus healed her, he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and, um, and it left her. And the same word here for rebuke uh, the fever is the same word he uses two verse, a few verses before when he's rebuking the demon that was in that man in the synagogue. So this is really in the Gospel of Luke, the first verse or the first scripture that we have where we have an indication that sickness can be demonic, right? Because he's rebuking the spirit, right? So anyway, she, she's up and she starts to look after him. And it's interesting, it happened immediately. So the spirit was actually rebuked. She gets up and serves him immediately. So it's happening just like that. So often when, when there is demonic sickness and you do rebuke it, it's immediate. The, the, the spirit's broken, the person stands up, they start to actually get better, and it's all happening, all right? Then in verse 40, where are we? Um, I think we're, yeah, okay, yep, okay, we're verse 38, 39, okay. In verse 40, it's, it says, when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid hands on each one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, and the, uh, for they knew that he was the Christ. All right? And then in verse 42, And when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. All right. So, he's in Capernaum. And the sun is setting. And they had obviously heard about what had happened to Peter's mother-in-law. And the word was getting around that Jesus was in Capernaum. And they started to bring to him anyone that was sick with diseases. All right. And uh, Jesus laid his hands on them. And then there was demonic release that was taking place, etc., etc. And then verse 42, uh, when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. What, what is the big implication on this? The sun was setting. Ooh. Jesus is actually getting hundreds of people coming to him there in Capernaum. And he starts to lay hands on them. And then here comes the sun. Ooh. So what's the big implication, guys? He was there all night. All right, now my Bible says that Jesus, we're talking here about the Son of God, laid hands on every single one of them. So how many people were there? All right, now he did have his disciples, right? The disciples were there. They might have been helping him. But that doesn't really happen until Luke 9, Luke 10. This is early in his ministry. Right, so here's Jesus, he's mentoring all these dudes, and he's showing his disciple basically what's got to be done, and he, he's showing them the ways of actually healing the sick, right? And he's also showing them how to actually rebuke demons in people's lives, some that were actually just demonic harassment, but there was a lot of demonic uh, sickness that was there, and Jesus would have been showing them how to pray for people that had sickness that was demonic, right? But the interesting thing here is that Jesus uh, was laying hands. He said there in verse 40, 
he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. So, like, just say there's a group of, say, 200 like there is here tonight. And most of you have got demons and you're sick, all right? Now, here's Jesus, the Son of God. He could have said, be healed, all right, as the Son of God. Would you have been healed? Would you have been released of demons? Yeah. But did he do it as God or did he do it as the Son of Man? How did he do that? In other words, did Jesus use his divine power, his divinity at any time to be able to do any healing or any miracle? He's the son of man. He came to live just like you and me, all right? And where did he get his power and authority to do all this stuff anyway? He got it from the Father. Is there any difference but then between Jesus and you and me? No, there's not. So what he did, guys, he could have gone, be healed. And every single one of us would have been healed. But you know what he did? Be healed in Jesus' name. I cast a demon out of Rebecca in the name of Jesus. Okay. Be healed. And then there's a lot of manifestation here. And, you know, oh, and, okay. <laughs> and all the disciples here are watching. Can you hold this one down? All right. All right. All right. That's the first row. That takes one hour. And we go to the second row. In the name of Jesus, be healed. All right? A little bit of manifestation here. All right? Uh, be healed. Be healed. He just works through each one. And sometimes there's really repetitive prayers where there's a need to actually linger longer because there's one of the things, one of his mandates was not only heal the sick and to raise the dead, but it was to heal the brokenhearted. Okay, so then he's actually praying for this person, be healed, and there's deep woundedness, and he takes this person. What's he doing? He's healing the brokenhearted. Jesus, healing the brokenhearted. That's my Jesus. And guys, when I see this about my Jesus, I fall in love with him all over again. I, I just love his humility. I love his humility. I love the fact that he would have spent all night with these people. And, where, and how did he get sustained? He got sustained by the love and the compassion of the Father. So, yes. Okay, so that's, that's Luke chapter 4. Then we go into Luke chapter 5. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, we don't. We, we go to Luke chapter 13. Yep, we do. We go to Luke chapter 13. Um, and this is uh, an amazing, this is an amazing story of, of Jesus healing a woman that had terrible long-term infirmity, all right? Let's just, let's just follow this if you've got a Bible. Luke chapter 13, verse 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Oh, my goodness, Jesus. You're amazing. When Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days in which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on those and not on the Sabbath. And, and the Lord then answered him and said, hypocrite, does not each of one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So ought not this woman, being the daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it. 
for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. So I, I just did a little bit of a Greek study on that word loose, particularly that whole idea of loosing the donkey, all right, from the stall. And uh, the, the donkey was tied up. And so the actual idea of loose is immediately to untie, but it can also have the meaning of destroying um, and to release so that something no longer holds together, right? But whatever happened here, it was Jesus actually released her immediately. And um, immediately she was straightened. There must have been some sort of infirmity where she was bent over. And it wasn't just a healing. It was a demonic bondage operating in her. And he just rebuked it. And he just loosed her. He loosed her so that she stood up, she stood up straight. And um, I love the fact that Jesus uh, declared this to her. He said, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. He laid his hands on her. And uh, she, was, she was bound in some way. Now I want you to just go um, over to Luke chapter uh, 9. No, if that's there, Luke 9. Okay. So now we actually get to the point where Jesus then calls his 12 aside. And by this time, they've already seen Jesus in action. They've seen him teach. They've seen him in ministry. And he gathers the 12 and he says, Hey, guys, um, I've got a job for you. Uh, I, want, I want you to go out two by two. I'm going to send you out. It's going to be a scary time, but don't worry. I'm going to give you power and authority over demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them to do two things. I'm sending you to preach the kingdom, and I'm sending you to heal the sick. Right? So in verse 6, they depart, and then they go through all the towns, and they preach the gospel, and then they heal everywhere. And then in verse 10, the apostles come back, they return, and he takes them aside and he mentors them, all right, privately and into a deserted place. And uh, the, the, the multitudes then follow and they want to they follow Jesus and find out what all the action's all about. And so when Jesus then f sees all the actual multitudes coming, he then speaks to them about the kingdom and then he heals every one of them that has need of healing. You notice the sequence? Do you notice a pattern here? Jesus was always about trying to teach and equip and give people understanding, but he never missed an opportunity to heal. All right? It's almost like some denominations. You get a crowd of people together, you take up an offering. <laughs> okay? With us, get a crowd of people together in terms of the kingdom of God, and guys, if you're talking to them, don't ever miss an opportunity to pray for the sick. All right? Uh, if those of you who are going on outreach, you know, this quarter, okay? You may get a crowd that are looking at you, all right? And it's wonderful when people actually respond to the gospel and they want to believe in Jesus, but don't let that crowd go without actually also giving them an opportunity to know healing. Okay, now you may not have ever done it before, but don't worry. Um, I'm going to tell you how to do it tonight, okay? Because you're going to do it tonight, you know? We're going to be doing kingdom business here. So Jesus was doing it himself he not only told the disciples to do it but he was doing it himself now we come to the climax that's the reason why i've left luke 10 to the last all right this time okay it's not only the 12 you could assume that the 12 do go with the 70 so if that's the case then there are 60 others so some versions say 70 some say 72 all right so he, he gathers them together and then he gives them instructions. And this is Luke 10. He says to them, the harvest is great, the laborers are few. Okay, therefore pray, the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers. 
and he tells him to go. And he says, look, oh, by the way, I don't want you to take too much money with you. I just want you to go with the bare essentials, all right? And uh, I want to see you come back. I was talking to the Homes of Hope DTS about this. And my dream for one of our quarters is this. I would love every staff and student on a Friday night and we perhaps just give you $5 each, okay? We all take $5 each and we say, see you later. Don't want you to go home or to any friends. I want to see you Sunday night and I want you to go and preach the gospel, heal the sick, and then I just want you to trust God for your meals and your accommodation. See you later. It's my dream. I'd love to see that happen, all right? So I heard this story about one group that did this, and they took their five bucks, and I thought, we might as well waste it all at once. Let's go to Macca's, all right? <laughs> so they went off to Macca's, and then they meet someone leading him to Jesus, and he actually invites them home for the whole weekend, and they disciple him the whole weekend, and then come back Sunday night. What a story, right? <laughs> all right? But I'd love to do that, okay? You just go, and my goodness, can you imagine the stories? The testimonies on Sunday night would have a, this whole auditorium be filled with souls, people that would have been saved out in the streets. You know, power of God would have hit people. You know, people would have been healed. There would have been demons cast out of people. Hopefully, resurrections from the dead, and you know, people being saved. You know, all of this sort of stuff. And then they flock in here, and then we just have maybe a wonderful time together. All right. Well, this is what happened with Jesus. He got the seventy-two together, and so. Um, by the way, where did this other 60 come from? Who were they? Okay. So, uh, there was obviously a whole bunch of people who were following Jesus around. But what was to distinguish the followers from the believers and the actual followers? And, and actually, what was an actual follower of Jesus or, you know, like a disciple as opposed to the 12 disciples? I mean, how did you know if you're actually a disciple of Jesus as opposed to someone just following around because you wanted to get more bread or you wanted to actually see another miracle? I mean, how did you figure it out? I mean, how did you know? How could you become a fair dinkum disciple of Jesus? I mean, how did it happen, all right? Well, I, I've been grappling with that for, for months, and then I think it was last year I, I came across this obscure scripture in John chapter 4 where it said that, um, the disciples, the disciples actually, uh, sorry, we've got to go to John 4. Because if I, I'll say it, and I won't say it correctly, and I'll miss the impact, all right? And it says there in verse 1, John chapter 4, verse 1, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. All right, let me read that again. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, and then verse 2, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples. So, here's what happened. You're following Jesus around the countryside, and you believe, I, I believe, I believe, I said, I believe in Jesus. Everyone say, I believe in Jesus. I believe. I believe. I believe. <laughs> All right. So you have a deep conviction that you believe in Jesus and you believe that he's the Messiah. Okay. And you now are wanting to, you're now wanting to be a real disciple of Jesus. And you go to the disciples and you say, I want to be a follower of Jesus. And then the disciples would interrogate you. Okay, you want to be a follower of Jesus? Well, this is what it means, all right? And so then they would baptize you. And so in those days, you were a disciple if you were baptized to be a disciple of that particular rabbi. Right? So apparently, there were thousands upon thousands of people that had been baptized, that were following Jesus. How do I know that? Because John the Baptist, he baptized a 
the whole nation, huge parts of the nation of Israel and Jesus' disciples baptised even more. And I'm not surprised because of his teaching and his power and his authority. Right? So, the 60 were obviously ones recommended uh, by the disciples to Jesus or Jesus obviously would have had discernment as to which ones. So there were 72 of them and then he actually divided them up into 36 teams of two. He sent them out two by two and he gave them power and authority. Okay? And um, oh, I just love this passage because he, he told them to go and look for persons of peace. All right? And let me just say this, guys. If, if God says that there were people of peace out there, they must be there. So if you're operating in, under that conviction that there are persons of peace, in other words, persons of peace are people that are in the community that have got a network of relationships that will let you into the community. We're going to fast and pray like crazy that God reveals those people to us. Because, guys, once we find them, they're like gold. We've found the gold at the end of the rainbow. In my, in my, in my mind, that's, that's worth everything. Let's go after the persons of peace because then they give us that access into the community. And then he says, okay, in verse 9, I want you to heal the sick and I want you to say the kingdom of God has come. Two things. So what do you do when you preach the gospel? What's the first thing? Heal the sick? What's the second thing? Preach the gospel. Okay. Or preach the gospel and heal the sick. Or heal the sick and preach the gospel. Right? So, and preaching can be witnessing, testifying, all right? It can be proclaiming. Uh, you can be teaching publicly. You can do anything. Anything that's got to do with the tongue. So you're teaching, you're, pro, uh, you're uh, preaching, you're testifying, you're witnessing. Anything that's coming out of your mouth that's talking about Jesus. All right? That's preaching. All right? And then healing, you're praying for the sick. So he sends them out to heal the sick. Right? Okay? Then they come back in verse 17... And he says, the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And then Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to trample on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. All right. So in verse 9, he says, heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God. They come back and they say, even the demons are subject to us in your name. What is the big implication here? It's huge. They went out to pray for the sick, but what happened? They encountered demons. And you know what Jesus said? I saw Satan fall from heaven. Now guys... Here's how we, um, we disempower the devil in our regions, in our areas. We've got to preach, we've got to teach, we've got to testify. We've got to pray for the sick. And guys, when you start praying for the sick, my goodness, that's when stuff starts to happen. All right? Stuff starts to happen when the power of God starts to move. All right? And the enemy gets disarmed. All right? You disarm the enemy in this person, that person, this person and key people all around community and society, all right? And what happens is that the enemy gets so disarmed, he actually starts to actually be threatened, and he's so disarmed, then the kingdom of God comes in such a way that the power of the enemy falls, right? And my good friend Ed Silvosa, in talking about the book of Luke, says that from Luke 10 on, it's much easier for the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't encounter as much resistance as what he did in the first 10 chapters of the book of Luke. Okay? And it all happened in 36 teams of two. Going out, preaching, proclaiming, healing the sick. And, and, and inevitably, that will cause you to have to really bind the enemy. All right. Now, here's the problem. In Western Christianity... We've, we've actually um, lost something in relation to understanding the power of God. 
And the other thing is that we don't know who we are in Christ. We don't, now, we don't know our authority. We just don't know it. But we have the creator of the universe who also came and lived amongst us, who went to hell and disarmed the devil and actually took the keys of hell and death out of his hands and then rose from the dead and then defeated death for all time. That's the second death that you and I would never have to go there if we believe in Jesus, all right? We have that same God in us, right? In us. And my Bible says it's just not Jesus. It's also the Father. And it's just not the Father. It's the Holy Spirit. We've got the three guys inside of us. Okay? We're possessed. Everyone say, I'm possessed. You're possessed by three. You've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. All of you. All of us. All right? When I was marrying someone recently, I said, um, there's not only three of you that are here today, there is five of you. <coughs> there's the husband and the wife, and then there's Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. There's five people here right now. <laughs> Try and get a handle on that one, all right? Okay? So we've got all of this inside of us, guys. So therefore, why, why aren't we using it? Okay? And the, the way in which it actually gets released, it, this, is, this, is the, the most, this is probably the most profound thing of the kingdom of God is through two things. You've got to believe it and you've got to speak it. You've got to know it, you know, and, and believe it. But then once you know it and believe it, there's no, chance, there's no use just knowing it and believing it. You've got to speak it. You've, you've got to put the power of God to the test in a good way. You, you've got to try it. You've got to then have a go and, and, and go for it, right? Now, when Jesus healed people, he did not pray to the Father, like the woman who actually had the infirmity for 18 years. He just went up to her and said, you are loosed, right? Because he had authority to do that, right? Now, when Jesus rose from the dead, he says, all authority has been given unto me. I therefore now, though, give you that authority, all right? And so in the same way, Jesus said, in the same way that I'm sent, I am now sending you, all right? So Jesus does not differentiate his sonship from us. He says, you're as much a son as what I am, except I'm just the first son, all right? I'm bringing you into sonhood i'm bringing you into daughterhood and i am also bestowing on you the same authority that was given to me by the father i am giving it to you all right so therefore uh, jesus is seated at the right hand of the father and then when we believe in jesus together with our brothers and sisters the bible says that we are seated at the right hand of jesus who is seated at the right hand of the father all right and that we, with Jesus, are then seated with him above all principality and power and demons, and that we have the authority in Christ to bring every authority or every enemy under the feet of Jesus. That is our role. Our role as a church is to enforce the victory of the cross. And when you and I go into society and we go out there, we are the carriers of this authority. And we don't see it actually happening unless we believe it, therefore know it, and speak it. Now, when Jesus said, be healed, people were healed. So he gives us authority. And we shouldn't be in that situation where we're asking God to heal. We already have the authority. So therefore, we step into that authority as we step into our shoes. We step into it and we say, be healed in Jesus' name. We say, be healed in Jesus' name. We say, be healed in Jesus' name. Now, I don't know about you, but in, in my book, I have a greater sense of authority when I just say that. Because I'm not... I'm not speaking up there. I'm taking the authority that has already been given to me. And it pleases Jesus that we do that. Because then he knows that we've got it. 
He's been, he's been sending the Holy Spirit to try and give us this revelation. When will my church know that they've got the authority? And he keeps on, he keeps on trying to woo us and appeal to us. When are they going to get this? And guys, it pleases God that we would know our authority and speak it. All right? Now, when you pray for someone, guys, uh, have your eyes open. You, you worship God with your eyes closed, but you pray for people with your eyes open. All right? Look at them. All right? It's possible to actually pray and have your eyes open. Uh, you... you you're not backsliding if you have your eyes open and you are praying, all right? It's okay, all right? All right? Then when you pray for someone and they tell you what their need is, uh, just say it is a healing situation and they've got a pain in the neck or a pain in the head or they've got um, something in their leg or their knee or their back, right? And if they're the same gender, you, you can just put your hand on that area directly, Okay. Uh, if not, then you know. See if there's somebody else that's the same gender. Uh, if it's not possible, get them to put their hand on that area, and then you can put your hand on their. You can put your hand on on their arm. Okay, and uh, you know you can always ask the permission to do that. All right, but then um, move into your authority, and then just say, "Be healed." In Jesus' name. Be healed. Uh, be healed, pain in the arm. Be healed, pain in the neck. Be healed, all right? And speak specifically to the area. If it's a pain in the leg, be healed, pain in the knee, all right? And uh, wait and look and allow the Holy Spirit to flow out of you like a river of living water, all right? Go at it two or three times. And sometimes when you actually say healing, be healed, you'll actually see the power of God coming on them. There'll be something that'll happen to their face. It's almost like it's being washed. There's something coming over it. It's like a, it's like a cloak coming over them. You see, you see something spiritual coming. And sometimes there's physical evidence. You start to see a fluttering of the eyelids and the, you start to see something happening over the face and, and, uh, and things like that. All right? And there's evidence of the power of God coming on them. All right? And then after you've prayed for them, then ask them, are you better? Because you've had faith for healing. Ask them if they're better. And uh, how would you know that you are better? You know? I mean, did you have the pain before? Um, yes, I did. Is it there now? Uh, hopefully it's gone. And, and the... the uh, the testimony then that they can give to the group was, I had a pain in the back or I had a pain in the neck, I had somewhere, and now I was prayed for, and now it's no longer there. And if you can do that in a group, then testify to that and just say it's an open air, that will stimulate faith. More and more people will want to come forward for prayer, and then you can go like that all day. You know, okay? Uh, if, if you're in a time of prayer and you suspect that there might be the demonic, right? Okay, like there was. So then it might be the, the spirit of pain or it could be a fever that is a spirit of infirmity, all right? Uh, it could be a disease that is a spirit, all right? And if you're not sure, uh, bind it anyway because the worst thing that could happen is they get very free, all right? So then, okay, if, if you're not sure... You think it could be demonic? Go ahead and bind it anyway, but also pray for healing, okay? And then God will train you, okay? Keep your eyes open, watch for the power of God, and if it is a demon or if it is a spirit, they will know something happened immediately, all right? Now, the reason why I say this is because, guys, often in society when you're out there, there is witchcraft that's actually generational. It's gone two, three, four generations back in their family, and often the way uh, witchcraft manifests itself is in some form of infirmity and disease or pain or something, right? There's some sort of a lingering long-term thing that they've had all their life. And um, no one, maybe, has ever really rebuked the disease or rebuked the spirit, okay? Like Jesus did with Peter's mother-in-law, all right? 
So I just want to encourage you. Rebuke the spirit. Rebuke it. If you're not sure, go ahead and rebuke it. Worst that can happen is they'll get very whole, very free, very complete. Okay? And we want people very whole. All right? And when that happens, if it is a spirit, usually you'll see the power of God really hitting them and there will be something happening. And they'll, they'll, sometimes there's breathing that's taking place. There's heavy breathing. And sometimes they're, they're almost collapsing because it's like the power of God has hit them and their knees are getting weak and they've just got to sit down and they say, or sometimes say, what was that? It was like electricity that just went through me. I felt warmth going through there. Or what was that going through my knee? You know, and, the, and that's the power of God breaking some sort of a spirit. And when Caleb was around about 14, 15, we did this bike around the river. And he had this mate, uh, Michael, who had a Buddhist background. And he, they just loved riding bikes, right? And uh, I think that one day they rode around the river from bridge to bridge 15 times. And then that's, that's 10 kilometers. They did 150 meters the whole day. Anyway, they came back and their legs were like pulp. And uh, Michael said, my legs are so sore. And I, I just felt to say to him, look, oh, Mike, look, we're praying people. Look, would you mind if I prayed for you? He said, sure, do whatever you want. Right? I said, you know, in the name of Jesus, we be healed in Jesus' name. He says, what was that? You know, and uh, he said, it was like electricity going through me. I said, it was the power of God. He says, I'm better. And then Jesus, uh, then, uh, not Jesus, um, Caleb's over to the side saying, me too, me too. Because, see, his legs were like pulp as well. So we prayed for him and he got healed as well, right? Then, I think last week, where I was in, was it last week or the week before? Was it last week in the Homes of Hope? Uh, we had short-term sicknesses and we had long-term sicknesses. And uh, we divided it up and we prayed for the short-termers and um, then they got healed and then we prayed for the long-termers and then they got healed. All right? So normally, uh, it's only about 30 or 40%, but we had 100% that day. Everybody got healed. Right? So here's two testimonies. Okay? Okay, so I got here from two things. Um, one thing is that my right leg was shorter than my left leg, and we prayed for it, and it just grew. I could feel it. I could see it, and now my legs are the same length. Um, that's the first thing. And the second thing is I was um, lactose intolerant, so I couldn't have any milk, cream, yogurt, stuff like that, but now I'm able to eat it again. And I tried it this night, and I ate this much ice cream and it's good. <laughs> yeah, so I injured my knees really bad in a high school from like high jump and triple jump and it's been hurting the past three years and so we just prayed for it. Just felt the power of God, so much warmth, so much like electricity going through, just totally healed. Now like whenever like I'm kneeling in worship and stuff, like I'm like, wait, like how long am I gonna stay down here before it starts hurting? It's just like it doesn't hurt anymore. So it's just awesome and just yeah. Yeah, so it was really cool because God just told me to go to the city and pray for people. And so I was with my buddy Troy, and we went out, and I'm like, all right, cool. I want to see some miracles, you know? And so we're walking around. We see this guy on crutches. He's sitting down, and he had, like, um, like this thing wrapped around his knee and stuff. We go up to him, like, hey, what's wrong, you know? And he dislocated both his knees, and he was going to be going into surgery the next day. We're like, cool, well, God's going to come and touch, and you're going to get healed. He's like, okay. So we just laid our hands on it. We said, be healed in Jesus' name. And he was like, well, what's going on? I'm like, that's the Holy Spirit. Like, don't, you know, don't resist. You know, I said, more, Lord, just give more. He got up, put his crutches down, totally healed. Um, Rod, do you mind if I tell your story? Is that all right? So I was in China a few years ago, and um, Rod was there, and um, uh, we were in a coffee shop, I think, and we were chatting, and he mentioned his knees, that they were really sore, and there was a lot of pain, right? And I just thought I'd just investigate a little bit more, and it turned out that there was, um, there was the Masonic in his life, in his background, right? Freemasonry, okay? 
Freemasonry hangs around wherever the English went and wherever, you know, like if there's Protestantism uh, and, it, and if the British were there, had been there, then usually Masonic is there. And it's sort of like they're, uh, uh, they're, 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 they're like, yeah, it's, a, it's a very deceptive, demonic thing. It's like an idol. And then many church people, men only, would actually get involved in it. And, uh, but then it, because it's idolatrous, you know, and it's a worshipping of false god, it, it then brings things generationally, right? So with, with Rod, who found out that was there, and then we had a time of prayer. And I, I think that, you know, it all happened when he was a little kid and, you know, he just felt like, you know, there was something that was thumping his legs. And then from that day on, his legs were always sore, right? So anyway, we prayed for him uh, to be totally released from that. And it was like, it was pretty immediate, wasn't it? It was like a pretty immediate healing. And then I think his parents arrived the next week or not next, yeah, and uh, he had to he had to take boxes up and down stairs, and he says, and they the parents were saying, "What's happened to you, Rod? <laughs> You've never been like this." And uh, he was going up and down stairs and doing all sorts of things, and it was God had healed him totally, right? And he wasn't able to do that for all of his life, right? The reason why I'm mentioning that, guys, is this, and it's a hunch I've got because of the word I had related to the surge this week. I just feel like there's there's bondages that are to be broken tonight i really feel that i really sense that we're to break bondages of infirmity uh, of sickness of pain all right now that's not to mean that we're not to pray for healing all right but it's sort of like a, a um yeah you know it's like a sheep in wolf's clothing it's um it, there's something very subtle and subliminal that sometimes can just be lurking there for years and we don't know that it's a demonic thing, all right? So what I want you to do is that I want you to, if there's any here that really do need prayer tonight, we're just going to pray for you. And whether you know it or not, whether or not it's sort of, if it's just pain or whatever, or a disease or something, uh, I'm just going to encourage ones around you to pray for you and I want you to pray with your eyes open. I want you to say, be healed in Jesus' name. And I also want you to break the actual bondage. I say, I just rebuke it. I rebuke this disease. I rebuke this pain. I, I rebuke it in Jesus' name. And if it's a pain in the head, pain in the neck, or if there's a disease or something that's been long-term, like an illness, I want you to actually speak healing, but I want you to rebuke it as well in Jesus' name. I want you to do both, all right? And I sense there's going to be enormous breakthrough tonight, all right? And Bo, I think oh, you've got to be ready because we're going to have a hallelujah joy, joy, joy time, wherever you are, mate. We're, we're, it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of joy here. People are going to be totally set free, all right? It's going to happen, all right? Now, here's my question. How many of you have got a short-term illness sickness right now? All right? How many of you got something long-term that's been around for a long time? All right, you're going to get healed. We're going to trust God for 100% tonight. All right? Amen? Amen? Come on, guys. Do you believe it? All right? All right. All right. As, as your faith is, so let it be unto you. All right? Now, that's as much for those that are praying as for those who are going to be prayed for. All right? You really have a real sense that God wants to heal you. But the people that are praying, step into your authority. Step into who you are as a child of God and say, be healed. And I rebuke the spirit of pain. I rebuke this disease. I rebuke this long-term thing in Jesus' name. Keep your eyes open and then wait. Okay, guys? It, sometimes we just, we, we, we're so fast foodish, you know, like... We, we pray for people and then we just move on. Guys, pray for the person and wait for the power of God. Jesus said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem until I come. So wait, look, and then see. The power of God will come upon that person, all right? And uh, many times you'll just see the power of God just coming on that person. It's like oil, all right? Don't get impatient, 
is the Holy Spirit will come. Just wait for the Holy Spirit to come, all right? All right, long-termers, you're going to pray for the short-termers, all right? Those, you know, because so, there's a lot of you, so I don't know. So we want three or four around every person, all right? So those that are short-term, just stand up. Short-term illness. Okay. All right, so before everybody else prays for them, I want you to get a target, okay? So I want you to look at the person and I want you to go and gather around that person, maybe three or four of you at a time, and maybe you could just come out into the aisle and then come down here as well, right? Just so that you can spread out.